Hello, I'm Mark Unkefer, and I'm the Executive Director of the Fiber Optic Sensing Association, and, and welcome to our webinar. Uh, and to kick things off, I'm going to ask our chairman, uh, Kent Wardley, to start the uh, proceedings. Great. Thank you, everybody, and I uh, appreciate everybody making time for this webinar. It's pretty exciting stuff, and uh, the name of it is Becoming Truly Smart, and how can, we, how can new cities add value to fiber with sensing? So... We're uh, honored to have Stuart Large here from Fotech Solutions. And Stuart, I'll let you introduce yourself and you can kick off when ready. But thank you everybody for attending. Thank you, Ken. Yes, yeah, so I'm Stuart Large. I'm Product Line Director here at Fotech. Uh, pleased to join you this, this morning or this afternoon, depending upon where you are, uh, to give you a, a look at um, our thoughts on smart cities and particularly uh, how city designers, architects can really make their city smart and maximize the value of fiber with fiber optic sensing. First, just one slide on who is Fotec. Uh, we're a company that's been around since 2008. Uh, we obviously uh, distributed acoustic sensing uh, is at our core and we've been working in the energy, the security and the transport sectors uh, for, for these last uh, years. Now, we have an international workforce. Uh, we, we do operate across the globe, and we have ex expertise and experience in industrial photonics uh, t and technology spanning uh, artificial intelligence, software, and um, you know, really uh, at the, the edge of uh, the compute processing as well. And uh, yeah, the real exciting step for us in recent times was being acquired by BP, a part of BP Launchpad, uh, which is invested in Fotec uh, because of the vision that we have uh, for the use of this technology in smart cities and intelligent transport. So we're excited to be part of uh, the BP's energy transition. So uh, let's talk about fiber and cities. So now, as we look at new cities that are being developed around the world, and they are numerous, and um, you know, huge, huge opportunity here. Uh, and as compared to you know, existing cities, there's a real move to sort of think about a surface layer uh, to try and make these cities green and more spacious and easily, easier to get around, allow people to have a better lifestyle. And all of the utilities are underground in a surface layer. Now, of course, it's the stuff above ground that tends to appear in the nice uh, glossy images uh, and attracts people to live there. But actually, it's the functionality of what's happening underground that is really of interest. And that's where, you know, that, that's actually what makes a difference to people uh, in, in terms of actually going about their work and their business. So as we consider all of the requirements of a city, its power, its mobility, its communications, fiber optics is really at the heart of this. So a city has numerous fiber assets. Of course, most people think of fiber as being a way to connect people, businesses, machines. But of course, to FOSA members, actually it's more about how we can use this fiber to sense what is happening in the world around us and actually provide information that drives decision making uh, or keeps us safe, allows us to be more mobile and uh, generally have a better type of life. So fiber optic sensing, or in our particular case, distributed acoustic sensing, is a way of converting standard telecoms fiber into a sensor. We send thousands of pulses of light along our fiber, and then we look at the reflections that come back through the process of backscatter. And we see that these, uh, the light that's returned to us is influenced by the vibrations or the strain applied to the fiber uh, due to what's happening in the environment around it. And in effect, we turn this fiber into a sensor that, it, that can be tens of kilometers long. And yet we can uh, see what is happening at all points along this fiber and use that to 
monitor for events or track events as they occur along the fiber. So if we look at this in a practical setting, here we've got a fiber deployed alongside a road. In this case, it was to provide internet to a village that is over the horizon. So as cars drive along this road, they will send vibrations and actually cause a little bit of strain in the ground as they travel along it. And that influences this light that's traveling in the fiber. Now, even with fiber on one side of the road, we're able to detect the traffic passing along on both sides. And also, it so happens that when a heavier vehicle, such as this lorry here, comes along the road, well, then it creates a bigger signature in the ground, which we can distinguish from another vehicle type. And what we end up with is some data that looks like this. Here we're just showing a little subsection of data, just 500 meters and one minute. But actually, this technology can monitor 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and over tens of kilometers. But there's a real richness to this data. So here you can see streaks going diagonally across the display in, in uh, two different directions, showing the cars, or in one case, a heavier lorry, traveling along the road. And it's tracked to within a few meters uh, as it progresses on the journey. But also going on in this display, there's a pedestrian walking along the side of the road, and we can see the individual footsteps as little impacts on the ground as that pedestrian walks along. We can even see the vibrations of an old stone bridge that this road passes over. And so there may well be information there that tells us about that bridge. If the vibration patterns change, perhaps the bridge is aging, uh, its structure could perhaps be deteriorating over time. So obviously what we've got here is telecoms fiber that has been put in the ground by, by telco. But, and in this case, we've been able to use that to track vehicles driving on the road. Um, but also railway lines will have telecoms alongside for signaling or for communications, which can be used to track trains. There's fiber alongside pipelines, power cables, and other assets. And so if we think more carefully about how to locate that fiber, we could potentially extract more value from it. And we're going to look at some of the examples through this webinar. So let's talk about traffic for a, a little while, for example. So here we've got a scene where there is fiber that's um, laid uh, under the pavement on the far side of the road here. And there's a scenario where a coach has come along, it's stopped at some traffic lights, and it's caused a little tail of traffic behind it while it waits. And then some cars, well, a motorbike first of all, then a SUV and then a car emerge from a side road. You're gonna see them come out just now in the video. And then after a period of time, the lights go green and the coach moves on. All of this, Everything's happening in the scenario is visible in the dust data that's displayed on the right hand side. So I'm not going to get too technical, but let's just have a little bit of a, a look at this one just so you can see what I mean. So here we can see the coach. You can see by its shape how it drives up to the traffic lights and then it slows down. The red light stops the coach, and you can even see the little um oh, sorry, just a moment. I can see a, a queue of cars building up behind it. Each of those cars is identifiable. And you can even see a, a little shock wave where the coach applies its brakes and stops. Then we have our three vehicles that come out of the side road. Obviously, the motorbike at the front has a lighter signature than the SUV and then the car behind. And then after a period of time, there's a green light. And then all of the cars accelerate and pull away. Now, also while all this was going on, there are a number of pedestrians walking around this town. So all of this is an excellent source of information that can be used in a number of ways. So let's think about one of those. If we use DAS to detect vehicles approaching a road intersection and we classify them, we don't have to be precise necessarily, but to know, you know what's a car, what's a van, what's a, a lorry or a bus, well, then we get a sense of uh, 
what's approaching our intersection, uh, how long it's going to take to arrive there. So then we can start to make some decisions and we can try to minimize the stopping time of those vehicles or try to keep them moving through our intersection. And we can use that to reduce the congestion at our intersection and also have a positive impact on air quality, fuel consumption, and improved journey times. So there's a, a, a clear benefit of this best data. Other use cases on the road can be to detect incidents, uh, detect stopped vehicles, for example, on uh, fast running roads, uh, detect landslides, uh, detect excavation, other works occurring, occurring on the road. Uh, it's all too common for a, a council uh, to get motorists calling in upset uh, that their commute to work has been spoiled by some excavations going on. The council isn't even aware. Uh, because one of the utilities has had an emergency has, and has got to work. Well, the DAS can inform you about these types of events going on. As, a, as you saw with the example of that uh, bridge that was vibrating, well, there's potential here for monitoring the health of the road surface and of structures along the, along the route. And then we can, you, can we have environmental data that links to air quality and noise pollution. Now we can also protect critical assets, pipelines, cables, perimeters. And here we would see uh, a number of interrogators that would be positioned around the city uh, in the most uh, efficient way to give decent coverage using fiber that is in place around the city. And uh, each of these can be networked together and monitored from a control center. And then we've got effectively the, the ears, and to some extent the eyes with which to identify uh, the events and the threats uh, that are occurring around the city. So let's look at a few examples. Uh, here we are protecting a pipeline. So um, in a typical scenario, uh, there, there's obviously valuable product that flows in a pipeline. Uh, these assets are tens or hundreds of kilometers long and run through all sorts of terrains, including city environments. And uh, there's opportunity uh, to tap into that pipeline to steal the product. Well, if fiber is near to that pipeline, uh, then the fiber will detect people moving around the pipeline, detect digging in the ground, excavation, and can raise an alarm so that a response can be made. That response could be by sending people to location, uh, or if there's cameras nearby, uh, getting eyes on the ground, or even flying a drone out to survey the area and to try and provide a feed, a video showing what is happening on the ground. So in this particular case, uh, just a fairly short section of pipeline, 72 kilometers long, uh, we actually detected 26 hot tapping attempts in just six months. And this was a typical situation where we'd find, uh, you know, obviously it takes a little time for, for somebody to get out there, uh, but by the time they did, there was a hole that had been dug in the ground, but actually uh, the arrival of the people uh, scared away the would-be criminals, and uh, the, the hole could be filled back in and the um, tap was prevented. Uh, so a good success there, and you know, occasionally they're able to actually catch, uh, catch the people, and then we have some evidence for prosecution. Now, in the early days of pipeline monitoring, it was largely about detecting threats to the pipeline, uh, what we call TPI, third-party intrusion detection. And, and, and that's because the fiber uh, typically would have been laid in the trench with the pipeline or laid nearby as a way of communicating along the pipeline asset, connecting sensors or allow, allowing those comms. But with the realization over time that if the fiber is better positioned relative to the pipeline, so you know, closer to it in other words, then actually it's possible to sense leaks. And uh, a number of different ways in which leaks can be detected um, and so, but the industry is now recognizing this. And so now when a new pipeline is built, more thought is given to 
where the pipe, where the fiber should be located relative to the pipeline, what type of cable might be selected. And at that point of design, it really adds little or no cost to the installation. Obviously, retrofitting would cost you a bit more and be more a more complex uh, situation. Now I can see cities following a similar pattern, recognizing the value of DAS and starting to think about how to locate the fiber, which needs to be there anyway, in the right place to maximize the sensing value. So when it comes to leak detection, here's a nice little example uh, where we are protecting a pipeline uh, in a very busy area, just on the fringes of a city, uh, but it's actually serving an airport. Uh, aviation fuel and so we've got a lot of uh, background noise cars driving on road uh, there's a quiet bit where the fiber passes under a bridge as uh, lots of activities going on but the clever thing about you know the software and the algorithms that are used is that they're able to distinguish uh, between different types of events the cars have a certain type of pattern which can be ignored uh, effectively filtered out, and then the signature of the leak can be identified and highlighted. So here we did 45 individual tests and uh, along uh, nine different uh, test locations over the course of uh, about a week, and we showed that the technology was able to detect the leak every time, and crucially, with no false alarms. How do we do that? Well, obviously, we didn't want to be uh, leaking the aviation fuel out of the pipeline and drilling holes in the pipe, the client wouldn't be too happy. But what we can do is a very uh, close simulation of that by putting a lance in the ground, injecting water uh, close to the pipeline uh, and close to the sensing fiber, of course, uh, so that we're able to show that when that liquid uh, is injected into the soil, uh, that that is detectable uh, by the uh, fiber and, and, and the DAS interrogator on the end of it. And, and there you can see a uh, couple examples where the, uh, all, all that road noise and other activity has been filtered out of the data and has just left us with the sole signature of that water being injected uh, into the ground. Obviously, in this particular case, it's not continuous. We would, you know, for the sake of demonstration, we would inject our water for a couple of minutes and show that within that time, we could detect the leak. Now, key to threat management is having an alarm system. Uh, and so, as you'd expect, uh, as events persist over a period of time, then there's a sort of tier system uh, which starts off with a green level alert. And then over time, it's escalated to an amber and then a red level alarm. Now, all of this can be integrated with a third party system that could mean integrating with the camera system, for example. So the camera system responds to, to those threats. Uh, it could be a scalar system. So the pipeline operator gets to see the information in their control room. Uh, or in the case of a city, it could be the city platform uh, so that it's integrated with all of the other inputs, which can range from air quality sensors, of course, cameras, uh, other traffic monitoring sensors and even uh, information relating to the population uh, and the finances and emergency responses, everything that's going on in the city. Another example of the use of this technology is uh, around power cables. So here we've got a nice little example where there's a fault on this power cable. And so when voltage is applied, and what we're seeing here is a length of about 13 kilometers of cable, uh, time, of course, is scrolling down the screen. So at that particular moment, voltage applied, the fault results in a shock, which sends a little shock wave in both directions along the cable and makes this rather neat V-shaped signature, which points very precisely to the location of the fault. That's actually a really valuable piece of information because trying to locate faults on a power cable can be quite a difficult process. Uh, typically, a cable is uh, um, thumped repeatedly um, over, it can last for you know, a good few hours uh, to, 
while you're looking, and then people have to go out across the city following the cable route, lifting manhole covers, entering tunnels, doing dangerous work, manually listening and trying to, to detect where that fault is occurring. But that same piece of information is right here in DAS data. We can see it immediately. You could also imagine that this cable might pass under a river or head offshore, in which case uh, yeah, it's, it's another level of complexity. Again, trying to um, locate that fault, doing it this way, you get that valuable piece of information very quickly. Now, obviously, cables uh, come under threat from you know, third-party activities as well. Uh, in this case, we're showing an excavator uh, working near to a power cable, but luckily, there's a fiber optic cable next door to the power cable, and we can use that to sense the threat. And that's obviously just a demonstration because this power utility company is interested in the ability of DAS to raise the alarm quickly, and we can see in the screen on the right hand side uh, there's a very small uh, digger uh, signature that's just appeared on the map. And, um, uh, and we're going to give it a few seconds because then a red level alarm is going to appear, and that's going to give the precise information about where on, on the map the uh, threat has been observed. And this would allow within just a minute or two. Uh, for the for management to be uh, alerted and for some level of response to take place. Uh, of course, it could be sending people to location or flying a drone out there if, if that's permitted uh, so that you can get eyes on the ground. And it's recognized, of course, that often the in existing cities, uh, the, the, the roots of the fiber cables and the power cables and even the pipelines is not always clear uh, and so having this extra level of, uh, of sensing so that when one utility company starts work digging excavating another utility company with a different type of asset can feel secure in, no, in the fact that they'll be alerted when there's a threat to their asset. What we don't want of course is that, is that digger to go through the power cable. So actually, a number of you know a lot of power cables will have fiber nearby or actually integral to the cable itself, particularly offshore where you have your uh, your three phase um, cables for say the export cable for wind farms or interconnectors. It's common for fiber to be a part of that cable, and it, it allows communication and sensing data to uh, come from the wind farm, for example. But the added value here is to sense, to de detect threats that may come about because possibly the cable uh, is becoming, is losing its, its burial uh, by you know, seabed currents are acting on it and causing it to be exposed and therefore it can drift and then it can suffer fatigue and break. Or simply it's a threat from a vessel, either from an anchor or a uh, trawler setup. But onshore uh, in the city, even where there are three phase, the three phases, each is a separate cable buried under the ground, it's very common to have a fiber nearby. But let's think about maximizing that fiber. We can use it for multiple purposes. It could detect uh, faults and threats that are of concern to the power utility, but it could also provide traffic information that is useful to the city. Then there's security of course and I like this concept of corridor security. Within a, any city there will be certain corridors. Uh, it may be for the, uh, the train network, it may be roads um, or it can even be a sort of corridor for utilities where there are pipelines for example. And so the idea of putting fiber along each side of that corridor, detecting when people enter from one side so they probably shouldn't be in there at all, but if they were to enter from one side, being able to detect if they stay within the corridor or if they exit from the other side, it's going to be useful information. You could potentially protect the corridor, but also track the trains at the same time. 
So one of our projects has been in Calgary, CFAS, which is a city fiber as a service or as a sensor. And uh, there's been a few aspects to this. One was, uh, or is, I should say, uh, tracking these um, trains in the light rail transit system. There's fiber, uh, in this case, legacy fiber, uh, that is owned by the city, that runs uh, between, uh, in the central reservation between the trains and the road. And therefore, uh, we're, a, we, we're able to track the trains moving in both directions on those two tracks. We can even see some traffic information. And there's a number of um, applications for this. One is to uh, look at arrival times of the trains at the stations along the route. And, and that's of value to the citizens who might otherwise find themselves standing out in the cold of a Calgary winter waiting for a train, not knowing when it's coming. But also uh, level crossings, uh, knowing when a, a, a train, particularly the heavy freight trains that come through Calgary, are going to come and shut a level crossing. And of course, because we can see not, you know, the start and the end of the train, we can have some uh, calculation of when the start of the train will um, reach level crossing and cause it needed to be closed. And also when the tail of the train is going to clear that level crossing and allow it to be opened again, which can have a real implication for the movement of, of the trucks that are moving uh, freight and goods around the commercial and industrial areas of, of the city. Another aspect of the, the work in Calgary has been looking at autonomous vehicles and the role that fibre sensing can play uh, in keeping those uh, vehicles safe and the people, of course, the users around them safe uh, and also uh, and ultimately uh, improving the efficiency uh, by which they um, move people around. So uh, in, in this trial, there was uh, a deployment of DAS, but also the use of some other sensors against which uh, things could be compared. And yeah, there was, there was some, some really good learnings from this. Um, there was also an uh, op opportunity to, to test with standard fibre as well as um, an enhanced type of fibre that gives uh, an even a greater level of sensitivity. And so what we got from that um, you know, was, uh, you know, the, the, the example we see here is um, you know, very precise tracking of the autonomous vehicle uh, moving along it, its road but also being able to see if there are other interferences on the road, such as you know, somebody walking or riding a bicycle that perhaps uh, shouldn't be there. But also what we see with fibre is the ability to look further ahead down the road or to look around a, a, a corner effectively, because the autonomous vehicles um, do tend to rely with, on onboard sensors, which means they have a certain line of sight. With fibre we can look beyond that line of sight and also we give a, an independent audit of that autonomous vehicle journey. Uh, it's early days in this technology, it's still finding its way and yeah, um, yeah, there's still, still concerns about the performance uh, or, or, and reliability of those sensors and are we going to trust the sensors on board the autonomous vehicle to tell you where it is and you know, what is happening around it uh, with absolute confidence. So what we have here is an established technology which has multiple use cases. Uh, and yeah, and what we need to do now is apply this to cities and to the realm of intelligent transport to tackle all of these um, uh, you know, different opportunities, monitoring of the the assets such as the pipelines, the cables and the perimeters, uh, helping mobility operate more efficiently, uh, keeping uh, people safe, keeping perimeters secure, uh, and monitoring the health of uh, structures, and of course, making the environment better. The other good news is that fiber installation costs are falling, and indeed fiber can be installed more quickly. Uh, there's, a, you know, there's, there's a great choice now of 
fiber that can be put into ducts in trenches, micro trenches, uh, even nano trenches and surface bonding. But the key to conclude now is I think it's about designing with intent. At the moment, we are looking at cities which have fiber. And yes, of course, the fiber has been put in with the intent of communicating, connecting those people, businesses, machines, and sensors. But what we should do now is design these cities with the intention of actually using that fiber for another purpose, for actually sensing what's happening in the world around it. It will be minimal cost if we do this at the point of designing the city and incorporate this thinking. So a nice little bit of uh, research here, um, sort of thinking about what was a smart city and sort of seven main areas there, uh, ranging from you know, services and utilities and surveillance, uh, transportation. And we feel that this technology has a role to play in six out of those seven, healthcare, maybe a bit more of a stretch, but these other six, we have a good role to play. And it's the information and the insights that this technology generates that will allow cities to stop crime, uh, reduce energy consumption, lead to a cleaner environment, prevent accidents, make transportation more efficient, and ultimately bring about a happier population. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for listening and uh, invite some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Stuart. Uh, you have a, a lot for us all to uh, digest there. Um, to ask a question, what you do is uh, use the uh, text box to the right and uh, uh, you can uh, ask a question. I, I wanna kind of lead off uh, one of the considerations in um, smart cities is in with sensors in smart cities and this is one of obviously a variety of sensors that are uh, potentially usable uh, could you address some of the privacy considerations and in, in how uh, how maybe uh, fiber optic sensing is different from uh, some of those other applications yes yeah, certainly i mean perhaps the um pe pe everyone on this call will be aware you know cameras are probably the most widely deployed sensor uh, in, in cities these days. And uh, and yes, you know, the software uh, is impressive. It can extract some uh, really interesting information from the images that, they capture, that are captured by those cameras. But you can't get away from the fact that those cameras uh, will capture images of faces and images of number plates and other identifying features. And, that's, and therefore, I think that's a real benefit of fiber optic sensing. We, you know, yes, we can provide very rich data. You know, we get a, you know, we can see how many cars are going along a road and how fast they're going, that sort of information. But we're not getting those identifiers that distinguish that one particular individual. Uh, and so, yeah, I really think you know some of those privacy concerns uh, are taken away by this type of technology. Uh, another question uh, really relates to sort of a potential other application, and, and that is with uh, structural uh, engineering. Uh, could you come in the role that uh, sensing fiber optic sensing could have uh, to monitor structures such as uh, dams or bridges? Yeah. So. Um, you know, we, we see where I showed you a very brief example, although I didn't go into any detail, where fiber was on a road that went over a bridge. And every time a car or a truck went over that bridge, it made the bridge vibrate. Uh, and so you can see the harmonics uh, of that vibration. Well, you know, if that um, bridge were to start to suffer some structural issues over time, you'd expect that harmonic to change. Um, but also, uh, also, I tend to talk there about acoustics and vibrations, but actually this technology detects strain as well. Uh, and of course, you know, with, with a fiber optic sensing association, it's not it's temperature sensing and, and strain sensing as well. So we can also use that to sense strain in these structures. And the same could apply to dams. There's a number of companies that are uh, monitoring
dams and levees uh, to uh, sense if, if that structure is moving or changing shape uh, and therefore if the failure uh, is imminent and if action needs to be taken. So I think there's a, a whole uh, opportunity uh, there. Um, and also I think we're helped by the work of the companies that are um, in providing those, or innovating in the space of the actual sensing fibers and the cables uh, so that these fibers can be bonded to walls or to, uh, you know, or, or to uh, you know, other surfaces or integrated within a structure uh, so that they are you know, most sensitive to those changes that we're interested in. Uh, so here is a, another potential application. I'll give you an opportunity to comment on it. Is uh, what about using sensing to detect sinkholes? And I guess both sinkholes that occurred and perhaps sinkholes that are uh, threatening to occur. Yeah, so obviously that yeah it is a problem, especially in areas where perhaps there's been a history of mining, um, or you know if you think about um, you know, with, with with warming. Of the planet, with, you know, and the thawing of permafrost, uh, we we see um, problems there as well. So absolutely, you know, where where fiber is present, uh, you can. There's a couple of aspects. One is sensing a strain where perhaps the sinkhole is starting to uh, move, and and the ground has started to move. But also, there's the seismic uh, investigation as well. Uh, so. You know, you, you can carry out a seismic survey. It's, this is it's been used in oil and gas for quite some time uh, to provide seismic surveys uh, in wells and also in mining. Uh, but also, you could um, you know, look for caverns uh, and other structural defects that are starting to happen beneath the subs uh, beneath the surface. So I guess the, the really the, the test there would be to be able to identify some signature that would be detected that then could be uh, built into the algorithm to uh, provide some kind of alert. Yes, that's right. I mean, obviously, uh, in the case of a seismic survey, you know, it tends to be done with a, or the conventional way of doing it is with a source, uh, which um, you know, sends a, a, a impact or vibration into the ground, and then you look at the reflections that come back to your sensor, which Previously was geophones, but you know, these days can be fiber. Uh, but actually, you, know, you think about roads, for example, or railways. Actually, you've got a different type of source, which is the vehicle, you know, the, the truck or the train that is moving along the track or the road. And actually, that sends vibrations into the ground, and you can look at the reflections from those signatures that, uh, that come back from perhaps the cavern that is down underground that you didn't know about. Good, thank you. So you mentioned fiber placement as being important to each of the applications that you described. So what what placement works best for, for say, traffic and leak, respectively? Well, yes, at the end of the day, it's, it is all about um, yeah, acoustic coupling. So the ability of the the vibration or the, or the sound, or if it's a strain event, you know, that, that strain to effectively be transmitted through the soil or whatever other medium is you know, between the source and the cable, then through any ducting uh, and our, you know, cable armor, and ultimately to the fiber. It, this, this signal has to eventually act on the fiber for it to be detected. So, you know, if, for example, you have fiber in a micro trench uh, you know, by the side of a road, uh, then it's in a really great spot uh, to you know, be in contact with the environment around it and you get some of the best data. Uh, obviously, if the fiber is down in a duct, maybe you know, a couple of meters down, then there's not such a good coupling. That's not to say we can't detect and produce useful information, but yeah, of course there are compromises. Uh, and so my, my main point being that at the point of design, you've got those choices. And so, you know, bear in mind the opportunity for the fiber sensing when you are designing and deciding where you're gonna place that fiber. And also, 
how it be constructed, uh, what sort of uh, duct and what sort of cable construction it's going to take. So you've, you've mentioned that uh, sensing can be one of a, a variety of, of sensors. And so could you kind of reemphasize the benefits or differentiating that uh, sensing has with say other sensors? We've obviously talked about video and, and others that, uh, how do, how do they integrate together and what are the relative advantages and disadvantages of each? Yeah, so, I mean, integration of sensors is, you know, tends to always be beneficial. Uh, we tend to like to think of uh, fiber optic sensing as being sort of the foundation to the sensing. Uh, it's the, because we're able to monitor continuously over space and time, uh, we're always there to detect you know, those footsteps of the intruder or the digging of somebody trying to tackle the pipeline. But that, that can be, that piece of information can then be used to direct another sensor, such as a camera uh, or, or, or the drone that will, can then actually give you a visual and actually get you another level of detail on what is happening. So that's, what, that's why integration is powerful. But then thinking about, you know, how we contrast with those other sensors. If you think about most of them, be it uh, cameras or inductive loops under a road, uh, even you know, axle counters on a railway, for example, these are all point sensors. Uh, they give you a snapshot as you know, the, the vehicle or the train passes overhead or passes through your image. Uh, and so you've got to then interpolate what is happening from one point to another. Well, DAS is great for that. Um, or if it's GPS, then although you may you know, have fairly good coverage spatially, uh, it has its weaknesses. So, for example, it only provides updates um, periodically. And actually, quite a bit can happen in that time between one update and the next. Uh, and of course, the signal gets lost when the device is taken underground, or it can have issues with um, you know, reflections in, in urban canyons, where there's tall buildings or underneath a tree canopy. So, yeah, I think ho hopefully that really highlights the benefit of, of the fiber optic sensing. Um, sometimes it can stand alone and be superior to another sensor, or at the very least, it's you know, a foundation and uh, part of that integrated system. I, I guess one of the things that uh, the traffic uh, the DOTs, uh, Department of Transportation, run into is with a camera, they can see it, see activity at different points along the road. And at one point where they don't see activity, they know something stopped everything between that camera and the prior one. Whereas with sensing, you can do a better job or a more immediate job of being able to identify right where uh, there may have been some kind of incident that needs to be followed up. Yeah, that, that's that's right. I mean, if you think about uh, if you think about a stretch of road, whether it's uh, monitored with, as you suggest, cameras periodically or inductive loops under the road periodically, if an incident happens uh, between two of those devices well then you've got to probably wait for a queue to build up uh, so that it then becomes visible to the previous sensor that's back down the road that could take um, a few minutes and those few minutes could be crucial because of course it could be a, a vehicle that is stopped in a road and you know all the time it sat, it's sat there undetected there's chance of uh, another vehicle you know driving into the back of it uh, and so DAS doesn't have that problem. It can always you know, be monitoring continuously a lot along that road. And therefore, wherever the event takes place, we've got some sensing there. And also, of course, if you've got all those cameras, it's very hard to decide which one to be looking at at any given moment. And you may have to you know, effectively poll and look at each one in turn. Whereas the DAS will tell you, look at camera six now and turn it this way. So it's pointing to where that car is stopped. So I think in discussing the Calgary example trial that uh, you referenced the potential for uh, integrating 
the technology in for um, enabling intelligent transportation. Um, how exactly do you envision that working? Obviously, this is a work in progress, uh, and so you've got work that needs to be done on on the vehicles themselves. But how would they interact with uh, with fiber optic sensing? Yes, I think that one. Is, uh, if, if we're talking about autonomous vehicles, uh, then that is you know, still a work in progress at the moment. We're really sort of understanding what are some of the benefits we can bring. But of course, um, yeah, there is a real uh, drive now for connected vehicles, um, which is sort of one step before autonomy. Uh, yeah, BP has quite a bit of interest in this area, and the um, and of course with 5G, where we see a, a dramatic improvement in latency as well. So there is opportunity to take data accumulated from roadside sensors and to get that into the uh, the connected vehicle so that it can you know, benefit from that information. Uh, I mean, just a, a simple example might be, um, you know, if DAS is monitoring the traffic approaching a set of lights, uh, you could you could see right. You know, you're you're expected to arrive there, you know, in about 30 seconds time. There's also a bit of a queue, so I'll build that into the calculations. Uh, you know what? You're not going to make this next wave, so just slow down, drive efficiently up to the lights, and we we'll get you through the next one. So that that level of decision, if that makes sense, and that and out of doing that. Uh, you have an improvement on fuel consumption and, and emissions, or you know, in the future, uh, if, you, if you're driving an electric vehicle, then uh, an improvement in your battery life because you've uh, not tried to race up to lights to try and make it through. Um, returning back to the the Calgary example, um, I, I'm curious if you, when you got out into the field. Um, did you find some applications that were sort of unexpected at the beginning where folks came to you and said there was sort of additional information that could be pulled from sensing that uh, I hadn't really thought about before? Um, yeah, hopefully, so I'm I, stump, hopefully I'm not stumping you with you. No, <laughs> no, no, that's fair. So I think the um, actually the level crossing one has been is an interesting one. Uh, it, you know, Calgary is interesting in that you know, the city um, has had the foresight to invest in fiber. Basically, every time they um, you know, are digging up the road for, for whatever purpose, they think about getting fiber in there because, of course, at that point, it's cheap just to drop it in. Uh, so sometimes, I suppose in a sense, they're almost looking for opportunities then to get value from that fiber. Uh, and so, you know, as, as we sort of explore that, um, Actually, you know the, the traffic problem that is caused by the big freight trains coming through the city and closing level crossings for, you know, sometimes 15 or 20 minutes. Um, actually, that, that it would be quite meaningful to be able to say, right, you know, we, we can predict the closing and opening times of these level crossings, and to provide that information to the trucking, so that the trucks are. You know, informed, you know, just stay at the depot, no point leaving just now, or you know, head down to this overpass where you can avoid the level crossing. Um, you know, just to, just helping that decision making, which have a meaningful impact on logistics and, and on air and on um, you know, pollution. So that, that I think that was a uh, you know a surprise one, perhaps that sort of emerged as we looked at what could be done. Thank you. Um, you, you referenced this, but it probably needs to be drawn out with more detail. It's a question that frequently comes up. We, we obviously talked about what is the sort of best way in which fiber can be located for various applications, but you referenced the fact that existing fiber, that is fiber that's already been installed, um, that can also be used. Can you elaborate on that? Well, yes, yeah, certainly. Where, where fiber is is present. Uh, then yes, that that can, can be used, um, and yeah, I, I, and also um, sometimes it's just a case of using ducts that are present. Maybe there isn't fibre yet, but there's often ducts 
ducts that have been installed for uh, for for other purposes or sort of future proofing. Uh, and so it's, it, it is often, you know, if you think about um, uh, retrospectively putting fibre in, it's, it is of course cheaper to pull it through an existing duct than to, to trench in new. Um, so yes, we should we should use that where we can. Um, the the challenge is that, um, you know, obviously this fibre is owned by uh, numerous um, telcos. Uh, often they they have some overlap, um, or you, know, you find that they cover certain uh, sections of road and not others. So trying to sort of piece together uh, the network you need, uh, you know, that that's uh, sometimes a challenge. In the Calgary project, were were the strain effects of frost heaving caused by frozen ground detectable? in DUC having uh, this application and maintenance scheduling? Um, yes, there's a, I can't say too much about that. It's not, and it's not one we investigate, have investigated particularly deeply yet, um, but I think there is some evidence of that. Um, you know, clearly as, we, as you sort of, with, with that dramatic change in cycle between summer and winter, it has its effects on the road surface and you know, therefore affects the signature that we detect from those passing cars as they are affected by the um, by that damaged road. Um, but yeah, I, I probably can't say too much more about that one. Fair enough. Is there a rule of thumb for roadside fiber sensing capabilities? Uh, this really references kind of, can you operate across multiple lanes? And if so, how many? And that fell all, I guess, with one fiber, or do you need to have additional fiber? Well, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, and, and that sort of makes the point, really. Um, you know, if, you, if, if the fiber um, is, you know, in, in a micro trench, so we're talking sort of, you know, buried sort of 20 centimeters down in, in a nice little trench where it's got good coupling to the, the road nearby. Uh, then you can expect to see quite a long way across multiple lanes. Um, and of course, you know, if you were so inclined, or you could also lay fiber across the, um, the lanes as well, uh, to, you know, perpendicular. Um, but obviously, it's, it's more beneficial if we can keep the fiber parallel to the, to the road and cover long distances along the road. Um, but obviously, you know, if the fiber is in a duct and and buried quite deeply and poorly um, coupled to the environment around it, then you wouldn't expect to see so many lanes across the road. Um, so, yeah, obviously so many different variables there. I'm, I'm not going to say there's a sort of a, a golden rule that, that we can work by, although, that's what, yeah, you could work towards you know, a sort of a bit of a table, if you like, that says, well, uh, yeah, this environment, this deployment, this is how, how far you would you would sense. But, um, I can't sort of go through all of that here and now. So here's another Calgary related question. Can you install below the frost line and still be effective? Um, I don't know is, is the answer. We'd have to um, look into that. Fair enough. Let's come back to you. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, that actually brings us to the end of our, our questions. And uh, we've obviously had a, a number of kind of very interesting ones about uh, Calgary. Um, is there a way to get more information about the uh, Calgary uh, uh, test? Uh, yes. Yeah, so well, my, my um, email address is still sharing on the screen now, I believe. Yes, so, it is. Yeah. So please do note that down and drop me a line and uh, we'll look to get some more information, discuss it further. Well, thank you very much, uh, Stuart. Um, this presentation, as are all of uh, FOSA's presentations, will be up on our YouTube uh, channel, uh, which gets a fair amount of traffic. Actually, we get probably more people listening or viewing uh, with there than we do on the live, uh, but also uh, folks should feel free to uh, reach out to you if you've got more specific questions that uh, you're interested in uh, uh, getting uh, more data on. 
So that concludes this uh, webinar, and uh, we thank you very much for your presentation, Stuart. Yeah, thank uh, thank you. Th thanks for listening. Thanks for the opportunity. And yes, please do drop me a line with some questions. And thanks for everybody attending.